photography, fashion, makeup, um, hair. How do we? How do I? How does that become just as like important as? being an attorney. Everybody goes to all of these years of schooling because they want to have this dream job, especially in DC, and it's to work in politics. And I was just like, doing hair took me to the White House and gave me a personal relationship to the first family. Yeah, Hair did that for me. Not law school, not medical school. Hair did that for me. Hi everyone, welcome to Dream and Colors with Zarabiti show produced in collaboration with the African Union. So the goal of this show is to inspire dreamers to become go-getters. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So today we have, I mean, talk about a go-getter. Today we have the beautiful Yanni Danto sitting right here next to us. So Yanni, welcome. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. So a little bit about Yeni. Yeni is an Ethiopian American California native hairstylist who is a go-to for one-of-a-kind fashion-forward hairdressing. Right after cosmetology school, Yeni launched her career and in just six months she packed her bags and moved from California to Washington DC to be just one of the two hairstylists of the Obama family. I'm sure you're not expecting that. All right. <laughs> uh, but if you're ever wondering, the person behind that beautiful, flawless, silky, you know, sequencing and everything of, uh, you know, Sasha Malia, grandmother, and Michelle Obama herself. Well, look no further. It's our one and only. Yay! <laughs> Yenny, uh, you know, she did not stop there when her hairstyling um, career is soaring high. She still went back to school and got her business administration degree from Marymount University. I think this was in 2015. Yep. And then she continued to opening her own hair salon, aesthetics hair salon located in yeah. Arlington. Arlington. In addition to all of that, she's been highlighted on major platforms. And just to name a few, uh, Washington Post, Allure, Hello Beautiful, Essence Magazine, you name it. So, <laughs> I mean, if this is not them, ultimate definition of a go-getter, I don't know what is. So why hair? What what made you choose hair as a career? For as long as I can remember, hair was just always a part of me. Growing up, I always played in my own hair and my mother worked in the morning, so it was just myself, my brother, and my dad. So I was responsible how I looked. Um, so I think the interest sparked at an early age and I started playing in hair. I can't say that I was the girl that like played with her Barbies. Um, mm -hmm. It was more so that I practiced on myself and then uh, by the time I got to middle school, I took up braiding and my brother was my guinea pig. Um, I started braiding his hair and really kind of perfecting my craft and then from there I decided to go to cosmetology school. So it was just something I think that was just in me. Um, I think as I've gotten older, I've really understood what is fulfilling about the industry and the career choice that I've made. But in the beginning, it was just something that it was like, it was fun. It didn't feel like work. It was something that I was good at and something that bring, brought me joy and was exciting for me to do. Okay, so you know, like growing up in Antavisha family and everything, like, um, you know, being a lawyer. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an I mean, engineer, a professor, a doctor of some sort is really the, tra the traditional way of like, you know, choosing about a career, but when it comes to your hair, so did you have any pushback from your parents Absolutely. or anything? Absolutely, absolutely. I don't even know if it's just Abishat parents, I think it's yeah. parents as a whole. Very true. Um, and then you add the layer of immigrants, being a child of immigrants, and parents always are gonna pressure you to do something, and then immigrant parents, and then Habisha parents, mm -hmm. you know? Um, for me, it was, it was definitely like, you're gonna go to school. And my parents agreed for me to go to cosmetology school while I was in high school, but the agreement was that I couldn't not go to college. Um, so regardless of how passionate I was or how much I knew that this was my calling and this is what I wanted to do, I still was like, I had to go to college. And so I went to hair school for my junior year of high school. I used to go at night and then after that, my senior year, I dropped out of cosmetology school because I was like, I have to go to college and I have to figure out how to pay for it, so I need to do extracurricular activities and build my resume up to make it look good so I could get into the university of my choice. And I kind of put what was on my heart aside to follow the dreams of my parents, and not necessarily the dreams of my parents, but what my parents thought was the right thing to do or was the right way to guide me or was the right way to lead me. And so, um, 
like all kids, we, we follow the path and the trajectory that our parents have created for us, regardless of what we feel. It's just kind of like, well, my parents only want the best for us. And, and so we're gonna we're gonna follow that pathway that they of what it is and even if our parents don't know it's just like this is what they think is best for us and there it's you know I, I had to come to terms with understanding that and I, I have this conversation a lot where parents only do what they think is best for their children so when they say we want you to become a doctor a lawyer an engineer it's not because they don't want you to become anything else it's because they think that if you are in this career path or in this field you won't struggle it will be easier than what they had experienced if they didn't follow that path or it's a legacy thing where it's like my father my mother worked in this field so this is what i chose and look at the life that i have so it's best for you to follow this if you want to be quote unquote successful um so there was definitely pushback um and but in the end i think that I brought it full circle and I was I stayed true to what was true to me in my heart and I followed that little gut and that little voice inside of me and I and I made the best and I'm a believer that as long as you give it 110 percent you could be successful you know so it's just it's about your dedication it's about your effort um, and it's about following you know that little voice inside you that's like keep going keep going keep going so um, interesting. Earlier on, you said something about you finding your calling. So this is your calling. And how do you know when something is your calling? Um, wow. Uh, how do I know that this is my calling? When I go to work in the morning, um, whether I have a 12-hour day, a 14-hour day, a 3-hour day, I don't, it's not draining on me. You know, for me, when I wake up in the morning, people, people are always just like, I'll be out the night before or being social. And I'm like, I have a seven o'clock ride or I have to be up. I'll wake up, regardless of how tired I am, I'll wake up and I'll go to work. And it's not like, oh God, I have to go there again. It's like, I get to talk to new people every day. Um, every hour there's a new client in my chair every couple hours, depending on the service. So there is a sense of fulfillment that I get when I go to work. Um, and it's not like, I dread it. I don't look at it like, oh my God, I have to go there again and I have to, I have to do hair and I have to deal with people. Of course, we all have the days where we're just kind of like, I would love to just sleep in and stay in and not get up. Yes, I have those days too, but I'll say 99% of the time I go to work and I'm just like, what is there to do? And not only is it that, like today, this morning, I did, I had one client. I wasn't supposed to have a client. I was supposed to do something completely different. I dedicated to say to have some time to myself to take care of some things that I needed to do. But I saw one of my clients on the book with one of my other stylists who I haven't seen, and I was like, hey, do you mind if I come in and service her instead? Because I just enjoy the salon life. And like when I leave here, I'm gonna go back into the salon because even if I'm doing work, I would rather do it in the, in the, in the presence of people, in the presence of my salon space because they, it, it's comforting. Um, so I think when you are figuring out what is your calling and what is your purpose, I think it's to figure out um, something that makes you happy, something that makes you feel good, something that if you had to do it for the rest of your life, would you, would you be happy and okay with that? And so for me, if I had to work in the hair world for the rest of my life, I would be perfectly content with that. You know, it would, it would be rewarding, it would be satisfactory to me, so. Wow, all right, so, um, so you left California and moved to Washington, D.C. Yes. You pretty much left everything that you knew, including your family, just yes. to move here and start yes. from scratch. So what made you take that leap of faith? Um, so I relocated to the DMV area in 2009, um, in April of 2009, and it was shortly after uh, the Obama family took office. And my mentor at the time was uh, working with the Obamas, and we worked together in LA, and he offered me a position to come and work with the family along with him. and. It was one of those things where I actually, uh, something that people don't know, or, uh, not as many people know, is that I actually turned the, the, turned the job down initially because I was like, I'm not leaving my family. I'm not leaving my comfort zone. I'm 21. Why would I live in D.C.? It's cold. There are seasons. Um, but I don't know. Something just came over me and was just like, why not? Why not just kind of test it out? And, and, and more than anything, it was, it was D.C. So it was like I had family here. It was like I was moving somewhere away from home, but it really wasn't that far away from home. It was in the United States. I don't have to learn a new language. Um, I don't have to like assimilate to new cultures. I just have to get used to seasons, and then I have to get used to like the roads. But there was a GPS. 
you know. Yeah. So I got my little Garmin. It was the first time I got a GPS system that you, the you know GPS that you used to yeah. go in the car, not the ones that are on your phone. And I, I picked up my life and I moved in two weeks. Um, and I, if I had to do it again, I would. I, I think I learned so much about myself as a woman. I think that I learned so much about myself as a businesswoman, and I learned so much about myself as like a person in society and like the role that I play and, and that my purpose is to be of service to others and I think that when you step outside of your comfort zone and you leave your safety net it challenges you in ways that only leads you to success and it propels you for what's ahead. You touched on a very important point there especially when you talked about um, you know a lot of times we ask ourselves like why 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 but it's always good to ask why not because that's when the, like the true definition of I mean the true parameter of like decision making is because especially when we ask why not like we attack fear mm -hmm. okay, you know what like why not you know what I mean so like thank you for that so um, let's talk about school even though your career is soaring and you know like you're already building uh, you've already built a brand and name for yourself you still went back to school and got your business administration degree so like what what inspired that I mean, you're already I mean honestly. <laughs> My parents will probably kill me for saying this, but I just wanted, this is, this is the pressure of like being a child of immigrants. I think that for me, it was just like, oh, you want me to go to college. And no matter what level of success that you reach, your parents still kind of are like, you know, she doesn't have a degree. And so for me, it was partially, the initial motivation was I made a promise that I would go back to school to my parents when I moved here. I was like, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna finish because I'm gonna finish everything that I've started was kind of the person that I was. But in addition to that, it was just kind of like, I don't want my parents ever to feel like they've sacrificed and they've given up for you know the comfort of myself and my brother. And the only thing that they asked for me was a piece of paper, a very expensive piece of paper mm -hmm. um, called a diploma. Um, so I went back to school and I got it, but I, I went back at 25 at 24 I went back at 24 um, and so I approached school a little bit differently you know I was on campus and I was in classes with students who just graduated high school or second year students so like everybody was under the age of 21 and here I'm at 24 I work a full-time job so I'd sit in class and I'd be like if you guys just don't pay attention so I can get out of here and not waste <gasps> this teacher's time and yeah. my time, I would be forever grateful. But going back to school as an adult is completely different. The approach that you have, it was like, I have this limited amount of time to get this right and get it right on the first try. Um, and I, I realized that as I continued to grow in my career, I wanted something that was gonna set me apart from other hairstylists and I felt that my my goals were bigger than what I thought that they were. They're bigger than just being a hairstylist. And there's nothing wrong with being a hairstylist. Um, but there was more to it for me that I, that I aspired to be. And so I was just like, all right, if I want to work with a brand or if I want to um, teach whatever it is that I want to do, if I want to open a salon, which was never part of my dreams, um, then how would I do that? And how will I have more credibility to do that and I, and I felt like having a degree would teach me give me somewhat of a foundation of understanding business and if I had that I would know when I would go and talk to people whether it was investors or if I go in and talk to someone at a bank for a loan I would know somewhat of what they're talking about yeah. I didn't want to sit at the table and just trust the other person I wanted to be able to be like yep this is what I need to do this is the process that I needed to take and as I continued to think about what was ahead for me and what I wanted for my career, I felt like having a degree and, and having formal training would only benefit me. It wouldn't yeah. hurt me. So that was the two reasons. Um, but again, mostly my parents. So talk to us a little bit about Aesthetic Salon. Aesthetics um, is my firstborn. It's my first child, as I like to say. Um, it is a small two-chair boutique salon space that I have created. Uh, it's my little oasis um, hair salon space for you know the woman on the go. Uh, living in DC, I realized the importance of like being um, like efficient. Um, respecting people's time was a big thing that I recognized, and I think in the African American and Black hair world, the, the custom is you go to the salon and you sit there all day. Um, you, you know, it's like you may have a 10 o'clock appointment, but you may not get in the chair till like 10, 45, 11. And that's, and that's if you're lucky. That, and that's if you're lucky. Yeah. And so 
I worked at um, other salons that weren't black owned um, and that serviced all nationalities and ethnicities and I realized that they just did something different. And I said, why wasn't there something like this for women of color? Um, because the way that we approach our hair or women that have textured hair, the way that they approach their hair is different. So it was just like, why is it that we go to the salon and we sit all day? But one of the things that I loved about, about the black hair salon culture was the sisterhood. And I loved like the barbershop experience where you go and it's like you talk with your boys and the ladies come and they sit down and it's like, girl, you hear this happen? And, and you know, it's like, I had this happen to me at work or my husband did this or my kid did that. Like I liked that element of the black hair salon. But it was just like, okay, how can I create this for like-minded individuals and, and business professionals? And how do I create a space where women could come and still we respect their time and they still leave feeling beautiful and feeling good about themselves, but they're not there all day. Like what happens to the corporate woman who needs, who has a, a three o'clock flight and has, you know, needs to get her hair done right before she leaves. Can she come and know that she'll make her flight? And so that's, how the idea of aesthetics came along. Um, and then I was scared. I, I, I didn't want to open up something too big. Um, I was like, I just need to open something small because I like the communal feel of it. I want it to feel like a family. So I was like, I'm gonna start off small and, and build something. And at the time it was just myself and one other person that worked with me, Salim. And it was just like, okay, how can we take what we have and like we just are gonna move it to somewhere else and, and design it like I wanted like to put my touches on it. And so that's how aesthetics really came to life. Um, and I learned, I think within seven or eight months, I outgrew my space. Um, and so I was just kind of like, I realized that the demand was so much greater than what I was able to fulfill. And so I really began to think, okay, like, how can I, how can I make this small space work? Because it, there is a demand and there's a need for it. So. Um, I'm, I'm happy and I, I think I find a lot of fulfillment and joy in knowing that aesthetics was created. Um, so yeah. So which leadership skills were hard for you to tell? Management. <laughs> management, management, management. Okay. Good. Um, Good. Management. Yeah. Management is hard. Um, and, and management, I say management because customer service is a part of management. And it's like, how do you, one, teach the people that work with you to have the same values and, and, and place the same importance on the same things that you do. At the end of the day, like aesthetics is my baby. It's my salon. So it's my name and my brand attached to it. So whether you go to me, whether you go to any of my stylist, people don't say, oh, I didn't like the way Yenny did my hair. They're like, I went to aesthetics and I didn't like my experience. And so that brand is a representation of me. So it's getting everyone to be on your team to understand that like when a guest comes in, you have to greet them within 10 to 15 seconds. Do you offer them you know, tea, coffee, or water? Do you acknowledge them and just, even if you, you know, if they're early, like I'll be right with you. Are you there 10 minutes to 15 minutes before, ready to work if your client comes in? Are you willing to stay late because something happens in your client's life and you need to accommodate them? Um, do, you give, do you explain to them what's going on with their services and kind of like, do you ask them, like I am not in the salon as, I, as often as I used to be, but like I said, I went in this morning and I was just kind of like, oh, last time I saw you, this was going on. Um, one of my clients that was there this morning who, no, who sees one of my partner stylists, she had a baby. So I was just like, oh, how was it? Last time I saw you, you were just going back to work after having your second child. So how's the adjustment been? And I was just like, when was that? And she was like, July. And I was like, okay, so it's been a couple months. You're back into the swing of working. You have two kids. Yeah. You're nursing. I take the time to like really connect with my clients. Um, not because it's a selling point, but that's genuinely who I am. Like you are in a sacred space. Like you are spending a, a, a good amount of somebody's time with them. And so teaching other people to have that same approach is, is hard. And and providing with them with customer service when people come in and they're having bad days like or a new client comes in and they have expectations of you to be a certain type of way because of an ex something that they read. I tell people all the time, it's always interesting because people are like, oh, you're so much more, you know, this experience or you are so much more different than what I thought you would be, positively or negatively. It's an expectation that you have based off of someone else's relationship with me. 
there is no reason why you are entitled to have that same positive or negative relationship. Yeah. It's a new relationship that we're creating. And so it's interesting to me because I had to teach my stylist to not take offense or to not, you know, put walk around with a chip on their shoulder. And, and a part of management also is, is juggling so much. Like as a small business owner, um, as a woman of color and as a female, um, it is hard to be a business owner. You play so many roles and, and it's, mm. it's hard to, to juggle all of the roles. So I think management is, is probably the biggest and most challenging part of what I do. Um, and just, you know, doing it with grace and doing it with poise and, and being humble at the same time. So what does it take to be a successful businesswoman? Let's start with what does it take to be a successful hairstylist? Continuing education is so important because trends come in and out. What happened, you know, with just like fashion, what our parents used to wear is now coming back into style. Yeah. Um, so you have to be a well-versed and well-trained hairstylist. And if you only follow the trends right now, um, a lot of people are wearing wigs and, and, and lace fronts and these crazy colors, that's gonna fade away and natural hair is gonna pick back up. Um, relaxed hair is gonna be picked pick back up. And if you only know one thing, if you only know how to apply a wig, your career is short-lived. Um, so if you aren't taking continuing education, you are only setting yourself up for failure. Um, even as a successful businesswoman or as a business person as a whole, not just as a, as a woman, it's, it's you have to be knowledgeable. You have to um, do research. You know, just because someone tells me something doesn't mean that I take it for face value. Go back home and, and the, the power of the internet is that you could, every, anything's at your fingertips. You could, you could search it. You could figure out if what they're saying is true. Um, and then I think another important thing is just to, to be open. You, you will learn so much if you are open. It doesn't mean that you have to take everything in, but listen to other people's ideas. You aren't the subject matter expert at everything. You're probably just the subject matter expert at hair, because yeah. um, that's what you're passionate about. And so you are willing to listen to hair, but sit at a table and have conversations with people who do different things. Like I have friends in all different you know arenas uh, professionally, and I take what they use. Like one of my girlfriends is a project manager. She cre she's a numbers person. Her skill set has helped me understand how to analyze my numbers and performance of the salon. And I have to be well-versed enough to know a little bit of everything. Um, I don't have to know it completely, but you should be able to, to look over your business and kind of have a general idea, even if with your accounting team, with your you know marketing team, whatever people that you have that help you operate your business, you should just know the surface level amount of whatever it is that you're hiring somebody to do because if they are telling you something inaccurate or if they're under delivering, you're able to be like, hey, this is wrong. And, and to go back to the whole thing about schooling, that's one of the things that I learned from my accountant to social media to when I opened up my business, everyone, when they told me things, I'm like, well, what about this? When I went to the bank, I'm like, but I know that there's this SBA guaranteed loan, so I could get a loan and pay a lower interest rate and know that the government will back me, but that's something that I learned in school. Business law, like I, I have a business degree, so business law, I knew the found, like the fundamentals. I'm not an attorney, but I could look at a contract and be like, mm, this is nonsense, or why is there not a non-compete in this? Or when I was looking for my salon space, I was looking at where there non-compete agreements um, in the plazas, when I was looking at plazas, can there be another hair salon here? And I, that would be the first question that I asked the people who find me. I'd be like, so there is a not, there isn't a non-compete. So where I currently am located, there are three salons, including myself. There's one across the street and one two doors down, but the property doesn't have a non-compete, which is fine. But you know, those are things that I learned in school as well. And I think that being um, knowledgeable in just a little bit of everything, business-wise, helps you become a better businesswoman or businessman. I have a feeling that whoever will be watching this or tuning to listen to this uh, <laughs> uh, conversation, they're gonna have to go back and like watch it and listen to it like three times, or three or four times, because this is a lot of important, like excellent information. So thank you. Uh, so where do you find your inspiration? Like what inspires you? Professionally, I think that the experience that I have with the clients that I meet inspires me. Um, it has it has motivated me to figure out what's next in my career. 
Um, when I listen to the stories of like the horror stories that women have when they've been in the salon and they've been there all day, that's what inspired me to open up aesthetics. It was, I trust me when I say I had no desire to open a salon. I had no desire to manage people. Um, and through that, the inspiration came. I think that watching the trajectory of my career, people, I had a call last night with a gentleman who was a makeup artist who I met two years ago and he was just like, do you remember that call, that last wedding we did last year in September? He was like, well, you told me to, to like know my value and to know my worth and charge accordingly and like demand respect from your clients and not let clients mess with your time just because you're providing a service. And he was like, you don't know how much has changed my career. Yeah. And he, he reached out to me because he's now looking into opening his own boutique space uh, with a hairstylist as his partner and they just wanted to kind of pick my brain. And so throughout my career, I have learned that there have been gems that people have passed along to me. And as long as I continue to share those with other people, that it helps everybody and so i i'm one person i can't service everybody so like the model that i have at aesthetic salon i share with so many other people because there is a demand for it and so talking to my clients every single day they inspire me to do to uh, their, the business ideas that i have that i have created and the things that run through my mind generally are stem from the conversations that i have in the salon um, so that's like professional inspiration and I think personal inspiration. I can't say that there's like one thing that generally inspires me, but I think it's that I look at my parents' journey and it's like, what's next? There's always this like, what's next? What's next? What's next? Okay, you've done that, now what? Um, so I find inspiration in, in a lot of things. I find inspiration in, in the kids that I meet along the way, like my friend's kids. I find inspiration, it's like, I've been fortunate enough um, I just did a book tour with Mrs. Obama and so like listening to her and the conversations and the questions and just seeing how hopeful people are inspires me to kind of just figure out ways. I was like, at a brunch on Sunday um, for Black Girl 44 which is a scholarship program that I was a part of and listening to the younger generation um, of interns who applied for this scholarship and how this scholarship impacted, helped them with their internship, I was just kind of like, and listening to their stories, it was in, it was like, yes, academically, people have mentors, but in the arts, in hair, in makeup, in film, in, in, in photography, like there aren't as many people who talk about internships. And so it, that conversation alone inspired me to think of how can we do what people provide for, you know, um, the academia world and how can we apply it to the, the arts? How do, how do we change the mindset for me, how do I change the mindset of not just African parents, but of parents in general of valuing the arts and not just like film and, and, and music, but like photography, fashion, makeup, um, hair. How do we, how do I, how does that become just as in, like important as being an attorney? Um, and so for me, my inspiration, I guess, comes from like listening to that person who's like, I've always wanted to be this and, and to look at your story and to be like, oh, I could, I, I joke all the time, like my roommate when I first moved here was an attorney. And, you know, everybody goes to all of these years of schooling because they want to have this dream job, especially in DC, and it's to work in politics. And I was just like, doing hair took me to the White House and gave me a personal relationship to the first family. Yeah, Hair did that for me, not law school, not medical school, hair did that for me. Who would have thought that hair would take me there? Um, and people of that statue also need a hairstylist just as much as they need an attorney or a doctor or an engineer or whatever. And so making sure that people recognize that we are valuable um, and giving a voice, more than anything, giving professionally, giving a voice to hairstylists and, and understanding that we are, we are what we are needed. Talk about your experience with the first family and how that that has impacted your life, and most importantly, pressure. Because you know, when it comes to like the first family, like Michelle Obama, she has to look intact. You know what I mean? Like she has to look her best at all costs. So, like, mm -hmm. how do you deal with <laughs> pressure? Because like somebody say something, and especially now with with the internet and everything, Ooh, trolls, not, yeah. trolls, trolls, so trolls. So, how do you deal with pressure? You have to be confident in knowing what you do, and I. I have learned to accept that as long as I know that I've given it my best, that that's the best that it could be. And I and I have taken comfort in knowing I had a lot of trolls 
that message me and they may message me about her makeup they may message me about her hair they may message me about her wardrobe whatever it is they there's an email address available for people to reach that comes to that comes to someone on my team so on my social media people would just email you know press email and they would write whatever they want but i always would i was like you are hiding behind Keyboard. your keyboard to say whatever it is that you want about a person that you don't know and it's so easy to tear somebody apart from a to z and back again just because of whatever reason it is whether it's you don't like them because of where they stand politically you don't like them because who they're affiliated with and even with myself like people say things about me positively negatively and i'm just kind of like eh, it's okay if you took the time to get to know me and then you formed an opinion then i would respect you but if you're a random person that just says something, I, you have to learn not to take it to heart. So um, with the pressure, that's just kind of what I take it to. Um, and I think that more than anything, in the beauty space, we are our biggest critics. Like hairstylists, trust me, I look at my clients and I'm like, could have I done that better? What could have I done differently? Mm. Could I, like, oh, there's one hair out of place. But I learned that nobody is perfect. So to have a client have perfectly coiffed hair is unrealistic. It's just, there's going to be a flyaway. Wind is gonna blow. I can't control elements. And once I came to terms with that, I think I was fine. It took a long time to come to terms with that because I'm young, you know, um, I was young and I was younger when I started working with them. So 21, never lived outside of my parents' house, never lived outside of California, walking into that type of position. Um, it took me time before I started doing her for public events, but it was there was always this pressure of like and there was somebody that i looked that i took the position after so it's just like can i live up to that person's mm -hmm. but then i you know one of the things that i'm grateful for my mentor he always empowered me he was just like everyone has a different stroke of the brush and he was like you may start doing hair on the left side and i might start doing hair on the right side he's like at the end of the day it's just like getting anywhere there's so many different routes to get to your final destination but as long as you get to that destination then you're fine to me i'm just like if i have haters and i have trolls i mean that must mean that i'm doing something right I, I, re I really i really believe that and it's, it's yeah. kind of crazy but I, that's the arrogant part it. of me that i'm just like oh okay yeah. like if talking about me brings fulfillment to your life i'm happy that i could make your life better like i'm happy that i could be the entertainment find something else to talk about so Love it. That's me. That's so how, 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 let's talk about the impact working with them. How has that impacted your life? Oh God, um, it has impacted me so much. I'm, I've traveled to places that I never would have traveled to. I've connected with people that I would have never connected to on my own, um, on my own accord. I have relationships with people that I never would have thought. And, and my perspective on life is completely different. I think that when you get to have a personal relationship with somebody who is such a public figure and you get to see them when the cameras are off and understand that they are still the same person and the same people with the cameras on and the cameras off and they are flawed just like you are flawed and they have emotions just like you have emotions, you realize that it's just like, we're all human and we're, we're more alike than we are different. Um, and something Mrs. Obama always used to say on the book tour was that, She's traveled all over the world and she's been to middle America. And when they were campaigning, they would go into rural, you know, Minnesota and, and sit down and have a conversation with people. And people would realize that what is portrayed of them on TV isn't who they are at their core. And they have the same struggles than, than that, that you do. Um, I was, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I've been able to have visited their home in Chicago and and kind of just understand and like be around their family that I have gotten a chance to know them in a different way than the American public has known them and there are so many more what she says is true there are so many more similarities that we have than we have differences um, so it is a good reminder um, to stay humble it is a good reminder mm -hmm. to know that the purpose is bigger than you um, and it is a good reminder to know that if you work hard you could do anything you know, if you, if you, any, anyone who's read Becoming, I read Becoming, Confession, I read Becoming, and I finished the book the week, the day of the last book tour stop in Nashville, Tennessee on May 12th. That was the day that I finished her book. What I did do is I read the book, I read the first two parts because those were parts of her life that I wasn't around for. But when I started reading it, I cried a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I also recognized 
there was so many parts of her that explained why she was the way she was, is now as an adult. And you learn through their experiences, it's just kind of like, that's what the connection was. That's where this comes from. Yes, you were bullied too. Um, yes, people thought this about you and they were wrong. Or yes, people, oh, you, she was a box checker. Or yes, you were, you know, there were so many naysayers that were like, no, you can't do that. No, you'll never achieve that. And it's just like, and then look at where she, where she reached. So um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a good reminder. Um, I, I remember reading about them when I would, I remember reading about them in cosmetology school. Every day I would get a newspaper and I would go to cosmetology school in the morning and I would read the newspaper and followed with, followed the election and the campaign. Um, so then to fight, to, to then work yeah. with them, I would have never, never did I think that that would happen. Um, so it's a, anything is possible, you know, anything is possible. And I think that again, it's, it's the reminder to stay hopeful and, and to stay positive and you don't know what you don't know and, and to keep an open mind, so. Let's talk about abundance mindset. The reason I'm asking this question is, um, I follow you on Instagram and I see you sharing a lot of tips on how to do this and how to do that and, and, you know, in regards to hair. And sometimes I think to myself, okay, like that's a lot of information to share with our competitors. But then I go back to being like, oh, this is what abandoned mindset is all about. She doesn't care. She doesn't I don't. care. So like talk to us about that. Um, you know, I, I believe that what is for me is for me and what is for you is for you. No matter how much I share with you, you can't take away what was meant to be for me. And so, again, I've, I said it earlier, I'm one person and I can't do it all. I can't service every client. And every client, I'm not the stylist for every client and every client isn't the client for me. And accepting that and understanding that you have to share your knowledge. And again, there's such a demand for the, the, the business approach that I have with how I manage my business. I think that there is a demand for that. The clients want that type of service. So I'm here in DC. I'm not in California. I'm not in Chicago. I'm not in Texas. I'm not in Seattle. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. I could only service but a handful of people here. There's only 24 hours in a day. You have to figure out sleeping figure out time for yourself and then, then there's eight hours eight to twelve hours a day for you to work so for me I wish I wish that there was somebody when I was coming up in this industry that was like I'm gonna teach you everything and I was fortunate that I had a number of people that were like I'm gonna give you this gem I'm gonna give you that gem I'm gonna help you here I'm gonna help you there and I've taken all of that and kind of like in, in, encompassed it into like this is how I'm gonna share. Because at the end of the day, what I know is people don't come to me just because I'm a good hairstylist. There are hairstylists in the world that are better than me. That's fine. People come to me for me, for my spirit, for my energy, for my attitude, yeah. for my mindset. People come to me because they care, but they, they love me as well. And so I feel like if I share that with everybody else, it, it's just, you have to pay it forward. Somebody believed in me and gave me an opportunity. So it's, it's, I'm not gonna live forever. I, I talk about, um, in my next business venture I've been working on, I've, I've talked about it time and time again about having, you talk about mindsets and so we talk about a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And the person who believes that through effort you can learn anything is that is a person with a growth mindset and a person with a fixed mindset is that they believe intelligence is a fixed trait like your eye color or height. Um, and understanding the difference. And so for me, it's like if I continue to work on it like a muscle, it will grow. And so if I share that with one person, if I create a platform, if I create something where it's like, if I share something with you, my only ask of you is to then share it with somebody else. And if I start that, and I have done that with the people that work with me, they will, it will just multiply and multiply and multiply. Um, and so pay for me, forward. yeah, pay it forward, pay it forward. And, and cause someone paid it forward for you. Someone sacrificed before you. We would not be where we are if someone else didn't sacrifice or if someone didn't reach back and say, come with me, sis, let me help you out. So all the feel good, <laughs> all the feel good. Um, so what's next 
What's next for Yanni? <sighs> a lot. Um, I'm working on an educational platform um, for hairstylists, because like I said, I think that there is a demand and people, and, and not everybody is as fortunate enough to, to go to school. People don't can't manage it all. So I'm gonna tell you what I learned and what I think is important and as it relates to our industry, and I'm gonna share that with you. Um, I have an online educational platform coming out for hairstylist. Um, I'm working on something special for the African market. Um, still testing things out, but trying to find a way to, to be there. Uh, I went back to Ethiopia last year and I was fortunate enough to do some free training with hairstylists there. And it was, it's mind blowing to me how there is so much talent, but it's just, it kind of needs to be like coached. They just need some training. And so finding ways to kind of be, I believe Africa is the future. I think that everybody is finding ways to invest in Africa and not all of them are African and that's okay. But I think that as a first generation Ethiopian American, I feel like I have a responsibility to go back. I'm not gonna let someone else come and teach when I could go and teach. Or, or, or share or help or impact the country in whatever way that is, I don't know yet. Um, but I'm working on figuring out a way to have a presence there. Personally, I think, you know, I've given so much to my career that I, I do think that I do want to kind of take a step back and kind of focus on what I want personally as well. So what are the few things you consider when you plan your future? Everything that I planned and how I thought my life would play out and what actually happened are night and day. Never did I think that I'd work with the first family, let alone the first African-American family. Never did I think that I'd live in DC. I never thought that I could deal, like never did I think that I could be away from my family and then sustain. So kind of my philosophy is kind of just like, let go and let God. Um, and just- Let go and let God. Yeah. Let go and let God and just, what happens is happens. There are things that I would like to accomplish and there are things, of, there's a trajectory that I think that my career will grow in. But there's always speed bumps and roadblocks and, and hurdles and life will throw things at you that you would never expect. Living in DC, things have came my way that I was like, oh, I didn't see that coming. But you overcome them, because that's what we do. We're fighters and as human beings, we're fighters and we're, we, we overcome obstacles um, and, and you'll be fine, you know? You fall, you get back up. I, I think that what I love to look at is kids, kids, I saw there was this meme that went viral recently of like these two kids, a black kid and a white kid, and they were running oh, towards yeah, each towards other. It, yeah. And they were so happy. Yeah. And it was just like, kids are just like carefree. They don't think about bills. They don't think about the stresses of life. Right. Just like kids just have fun with one another. And if a kid falls, they only cry if their parents like, oh my God, oh, yeah. what happened? Other than that, like if you watch a kid fall, they kind of look around and they're like, no one's okay. paying attention to me. So when they get up. But if you coddle them, they start crying. And so for me, it's just kind of like, I don't know. I'm just gonna go through life. And if this is the plan idea, like this is the idea of what I have planned, but if something comes to me that isn't what I thought it was gonna be, it's like, all right. Feels good with your spirit. Yeah, like how do we figure out how to overcome this and, and keep it going? So let go and let God, let go and let God. So That's in addition it. to that, I love that. Any word of advice for our dreamers? Trust yourself. Nobody is going to live your life but you. No one will walk in your shoes but you. So you know what feels right, you know what feels wrong. Just like you know what is good and what is bad. You, the, your spirit will tell you that and you have to trust that. If I didn't trust the, the feeling that I had that hair was for me, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, so just, just trust yourself. Listen to that little voice inside your head. Listen to that the butterflies um, or the burning inside your stomach or, or the weltering of your eyes or whatever it is, just, just believe in yourself and, and know that you are the only person that controls your destiny. So you have to listen to it. That's my, I that's my truth. I honestly don't know how to thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so very thank much you. for coming thank and you. like dropping I'm like all this wisdom and everything that comes with it. So thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you for you having so me. Thank you for having something like this. We are done. Again, yeah, thanks for tuning in. You are watching Dream and Colors with Jami T, collaboration with the African Union. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.